So each campus should sit and say, what are we about? What do we want to do? What do we want to allow? Just as they do with, I'm sure at Duke, they sat down and said, how much do we feel is appropriate to pay our coaches? Yeah. Like, are we willing to cross into the, the are, we, are we willing to pay our basketball coach eight, nine million dollars a year? Like, that's a great discussion to have on your campus. It is not an appropriate discussion for industry-wide policy to say, all right, mm-hmm. You, you know, you, this one class of person, you get only this, and that's enough. That's all you get. We don't say that to any other person. Literally, we don't say that to Never. any other person. Welcome back into the Morning Rush. I'd like to welcome in our next guest, ESPN college basketball analyst and former Duke Blue Devil, Jay Billis, now joins the Morning Rush. Jay, appreciate the time. Thanks for hopping on. All got some bad news with the passing of Eddie's son. When you hear that name, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Just old school basketball man. And, uh, you know, Eddie Sutton was a, a great basketball coach, but you, you could trace his roots all the way back to Mr. Ibo. And uh, so, you know, he, he goes goes way back in the game to the very roots of it. And uh, just one one tough minded uh, good man that uh, that was one hell of a basketball coach. Do you think it was wrong to delay his selection into the Naismith Hall of Fame? We didn't get to hear his speech. Obviously, he's not going to see his own. What are your thoughts on that, Jay? Well, it's a difficult process because, and I think one of the things that, that was difficult for, for Eddie Sutton getting into the Hall of Fame, and, and we all wish it would have happened earlier, uh, but one of the difficulties was not his, you know, sort of the idea that what happened in Kentucky was holding him back. My understanding is that's not true. The, the difficulty was um, the, the Hall of Fame years ago changed its, its uh, requirements for getting in, and that is, you don't you didn't have to be retired anymore, so you could get in uh, to the Hall of Fame while you were still active. So that's why you have guys like Coach K or, or Roy Williams or, or all that stuff uh, while they're active, getting into the Hall of Fame. John Calipari, you name it, Tom Izzo, Bill Self. So it becomes a numbers game. There are only a certain amount of of people, to my understanding that get put forward as uh, to, to be voted upon as finalists every year. And, and if you, if you look at the finalists and not to get too far into the weeds on this, but if you look at the finalists and really, really analyze this stuff, which I have, uh, there's a balance to it, a balance among NBA players, college coaches, pro coaches, international women's uh, players and coaches and all that. So the, the, the classes are always balanced of finalists. And I think it just he just got caught up in a numbers game because if you start looking at well well if you uh, look at uh, I don't know Tom Izzo or Bill Self or whatever against Coach Sutton, then you say okay who gets in first? And and oftentimes I believe and again I, you know I, I don't know but in looking at the classes I believe that that's more what happened than somehow because Jerry Tarkanian got in he had a, he had a whole bunch of people that have been getting in with NCAA issues but I think more than anything the fact that you had active coaches being eligible for uh, induction into the hall was was the difficulty of coach Sutton having to climb over those guys and and up until this year, it, it, it hadn't happened. When you look at today's game and then you compare it to the style of defense Coach Sutton wanted to play, where he guarded the ball as hard as he did, denied the next pass, who in today's game, with the way the rules are set up, do you think mimics or mirrors his style of defense? Oh, there are, there are coaches that still play that style. It's a little bit different because the three-point shot has become uh, such a big deal. So... I, I, and I'm not sure that, that Coach Sutton would play exactly the same way now. Um, you'd have to make some adjustments for, for getting too spread out. Uh, you know, your help side would have to be good. So denying one pass away, things like that. You, you may, uh, he may have decided to play a little bit more uh, containment. Who knows? But, uh, but there, are, there are still coaches that play, you know, sort of smash mouth, uh, tough defense and half-court defense. That's not, that, that's not gone away. I would say, even though it's a pack line um, uh, defense, I think Tony Bennett uh, has a, has still some of the principles. That, but what what Coach Sutton did more than anything was it, just like Mr. Iba was the uh, half court pressure, pressure the ball, deny, 
uh, chest to chest defense, and uh, and he was a master. At, he, but he was a master at, at every every facet of the game. His teams would press at times. They would press to speed you up. They would press to slow you down. Uh, you know, so he, there there was nothing. You know, he was one of those those coaches that he could have coached any sport, and he could coach any style. And uh, like his teams, if you remember, I don't know how old you guys are, but if you remember his teams at Arkansas, they got up and down the floor, man. Yeah, when he had when he had uh, you know. Brewer and Delph and Moncrief uh, went to the Final Four in 78. That's one of the things that I think um, uh, certainly had to be appealing to anybody who looked at his record to, to vote him into the Hall of Fame was he went to he went to the, to the Final Four in three different decades, in the 70s and the 90s and in the 2000s. And you are not going to find uh, many coaches uh, who had that sort of who demonstrated that sort of excellence uh, over that uh, that period of time here in Arkansas? We were spoiled. The solid half court defense that Eddie Sutton played, and then Nolan came in, took it up a notch, and now we'll just play it ninety four feet of up in your jock. So I mean, we all kind of grew up on some hard nosed defense with with Eddie and Nolan. Well, yeah, and, and and look, I don't know anybody that wins without guarding anybody. Um, you know, you, you, people say defense wins championships. Uh, you got to score too, and and his teams did, and obviously uh, Nolan Richardson's teams did, but uh, but I, I can't remember the last time we talked about boy that team that won the championship. They can't guard anybody, but boy, could they score? You know, you just don't say that. Uh, but but Coach Sutton was uh, was one of the all time greats, and uh, and you know I was I, I know you guys probably feel the same way. I, I was lucky to know him, uh, just a, a wonderful man. Jay Billis, ESPN college basketball analyst here with us on the Morning Rush. Kind of shifting the conversation, Jay. It's quite a schism right now in college athletics. The coronavirus possibly impacting the Power Five conferences, breaking away from the NCAA. Do you think everything going on right now is enough to cause them to do that? I don't know if it would cause it, but it's more likely uh, as we go forward. And uh yeah, I know there are some some folks that dif- disagree with that that idea because they think that that you know if the Power Five were to break away and do their own thing, they just have to recreate the NCAA as if that would be so difficult to do. Um, but you could recreate it without the gigantic bureaucracy and without all the ridiculous factors that they they put into play. So I think what what would be appealing about it would be you would have you know seventy plus. Uh, teams and they wouldn't have to they wouldn't have to go through that gigantic bureaucracy to get something passed that they want to do and they wouldn't have to share their money with anybody now the the downside is as as has been pointed out by a, a few commentators is they would be walking away to start something else they would be walking away from from certain money you know they know how much money everybody knows how much money is coming in from the NCAA tournament uh, how much money they get from college football and the like, uh, and the Power Five conferences control college football, but uh, but it would be certainly in their interest not to have to not to have to spend all this money to prop up all these other institutions, which is frankly what they've been doing. And uh, uh, you know, so those who say, hey, you know, they, they're not going to walk away from the NCAA tournament. If the Power Five created their own tournament, there would be no NCAA tournament anymore. Uh, the, the the tournament that the, that was set up by the Power Five, just like there's no, you know, there's no BCS anymore because they they started the college football playoff, and uh, you know years ago they said, well, we can never have a playoff and all, and now they have a playoff and it makes over a billion dollars a year in additional revenue, so it, it would be a huge revenue piece for all those all those institutions. Uh, but as you you know, as we go forward and college college athletics gets pinched by you know the economic factors of COVID nineteen. Uh, you're certainly going to see some some uh, the earth shift uh, underneath the, the, uh, these different sports. We're already seeing it to an extent, um, but does that mean they're going to break away? But you could make the same arguments like the, the the folks that are saying this will never happen. Hey, they may be right; it may not happen, but uh, but it's more likely. But but the ones that are saying that you, you could make those same arguments that well well there would never be conference realignment. Well, of course there would. Why is there conference realignment for the money? It's for the money. And that's why you'd see the Power Five break away for the money. Jay, you bring up money. You've been one of the more outspoken people that says players should get paid. I've always held the position that college athletes should have the ability to sell their name and likeness. I don't think they should get additional revenue. If they seek it out, then that's my position. What is your full position on players in NCAA sports getting money from their institutions? 
My position, my my belief, and my position is that athletes should be uh, allowed the same economic rights as anyone else, including any other student. And no other student, no other person, is told that they cannot earn or accept any amount from any source. Uh, so I, I I would have no problem. Uh, like like if if you don't believe in it, I, I'm not going to argue with you. That's fine. Then don't do that at your school. Just like I don't advocate that college some college football coaches make nine ten million dollars a year. I don't advocate that some of them make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. The market takes care of that. So if at your place you don't believe that paying a football coach nine million dollars a year is it matches your values, then don't do that. You, you can pay what what what's in your value set. That's fine. Um, but I don't I don't see how telling an athlete what they can earn or accept um, uh, is is the right thing to do in a multi billion dollar business. And the courts happen to agree with that because they've ruled. That, uh, that the NCAA is a cartel and they violate federal antitrust law. Now, the remedies for that haven't caught up with, with those rulings. But you can see now with these different uh, laws that are being passed, state laws around the country, that, that sort of the NCAA is, is being challenged in every way, shape, or form, not only in court, but in state legislatures. And, and the federal government is actually uh, dealing with this now. So what we've seen is now, recently there's a working group that said uh, players should be allowed to uh, take advantage of name, image, and likeness rights. Now, at the same time, they're trying to get an antitrust exemption from Congress. But, but that shows you that the NCAA ha- really has no principle with this. They've said forever, nope, you get name, image, and likeness rights, you are a pro, period. Well, now they're saying it's okay for the players to be pros. So they, they, they've got no principles here. They're just doing this because they're being, they're being pushed into it instead of, uh, instead of standing on principle. And, uh, and you, know, you would think that somebody with my belief set would say, well, that's great. Um, I do think it's the right thing for them to do. But but I'm I'm a little bit kind of peeved that they would all these years say nope we will die on this hill that this this is the core belief that we have that if you if uh, players have the right to to make money in commercials and the like sell their gear they are professionals well now they say that's okay so if they're if they're okay to be professionals in that marketplace then they're okay to be professionals from their universities too. Jay Billis with us here on the Morning Rush. Jay, you commonly or, or often when I listen to your broadcast, whether it's game day or whether it's uh, doing a game, you've got strong opinions about officiating college basketball. If you were in charge of officiating, what, what changes would you make? Well, I would make the officials employees so that they can be told what to do uh, in, a, in a more sort of organized fashion across the board. And, and we, I think we'd have a better product overall. Um, but I think overall the officials do a great job. They're, they're terrific pros. I think the administration of officials is poor. Um, you know, everybody's doing the best they can, but I don't think the best, sometimes the best you can isn't quite good enough, but the games aren't called in a, in a standard manner in my judgment. I mean, I see a lot of it. I don't know what you guys think. Uh, but there are certain rules changes that need to be made, but, but right now, like, you know, charges are given out like Halloween candy on October 31st. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, you know, it, almost every contact made by an offensive player going to the basket is called a charge. And, uh, and I don't think that's necessary. I, I don't believe that's good for the game. Um, but yeah, there are all kinds of things I think we could do to make it better, but I don't have any problem with the officials. The officials are great. Officiating is not great. It can be much better, but, but it's better. It's better now than it has been. And uh, if you want to see bad officiating, go back and watch some of these ESPN classic games that are on television. You'll see that. If you go back and look at the 70s and 80s, on a relative basis, officiating was horrifyingly bad back then. Anything in regards to rule changes? I mean, I know they're to your cycle when they make major rule changes. Anything you would like to see the rules committee, which is comprised of coaches, not officials, uh, anything these coaches that preside over these committees need to consider going forward with the rules of the game? Yeah. Yeah, we need to redefine what a charge is. So, so I think in order to get a charge as a secondary defender, if, if you maintain a legal guarding position as a as a primary defender, so you're guarding the ball, uh, offensive player puts the ball on the floor, and you're you know you're moving uh, and maintaining that legal guarding position, you get run over. That that's the kind of charge that that's a good charge in basketball. If you're coming over from the weak side as a secondary defender to, to just slide in front of somebody that's won a path to the basket by beating their primary defender. 
then I think you have to be in place to take that charge uh, upon the gather, not from the time the player leaves the floor, um, because that, that we're seeing way too many, way too many of those collisions, and it's just not, it's not good basketball in my judgment. Um, and then, and then there are some other things that 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 I think need to be changed. We we moved the three point line back, and we did not widen the lane, and I think that was a mistake. Uh, the lane needs to be widened to the same uh, distance as international basketball in the NBA. Um, I think that's an important thing that that we need to do. And we need to go to a twenty four second clock. Um, you know, little kids in in international basketball are playing with a twenty four second clock, and we act like our our players can't handle it, and they can. I mean, we don't have we don't even have shot clocks in high school basketball in most states, and we need that uh, because you know it. it too often becomes a coach's game, and I would love to see us go to the international rules altogether uh, because I think it. I think FIBA runs a better game. It's a quicker game, and um, uh, it's a better game. But uh, uh, standardizing the rules across the board, I think, would be really, really good for us. We're talking with Jay Billis, former Duke Blue Devil, here on the Morning Rush. Jay, we had your colleague on Seth Greenberg about a week or so ago, and we asked him about game day potentially being in Fayetteville this year. Now, college game day basketball wise has never been in Fayetteville. And I asked, hey, what do you think it's got to take? And he was pretty blind. He's like, we just got to win. Do you think with what Eric Musselman is bringing in and bringing back, what would you say the chances are of you and your other colleagues making up to Fayetteville for college game day this year? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's really one, it's not our decision. I would love to be able to make those decisions, but our bosses are really good with that stuff. But it really oftentimes is going to come down to the best place for us to be that week. So, uh, and, and oftentimes it comes down to the rating is the, the, the best rated game. So whatever the game of the day is going to be in basketball uh, that's on our air, uh, we are we are oftentimes going to choose that game. And, uh, uh, you know, we've had some places we've gone back to, and, and most of it, I think, uh, have been no-brainers. But when there's been – there have been times we've had, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a team uh, – two teams are ranked in the top ten, and people are going, well, that's the game. But but there are two te- one team in the top ten, the other team in the top twenty. But there we our people know this is the higher rated game. Uh, we'll often go to the higher rated game. Um, not always, but 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 often do. And sometimes when the when we have a Saturday when there may not be the most compelling games on the air, uh, we'll go somewhere we've never been before. So it really just kind of depends on the week, and I've kind of given up, honestly, trying to figure out what we're going to do because every time I think we're going, uh, we're zigging, we wind up zagging. And, and so, uh, uh, But our, our people, I can tell you, our programming people and the folks that make those decisions are brilliant. Uh, and I, I, after we've been finished with any Saturday, I have never said, uh, never once have I said in all these years, have said, well, we should have gone to the other place. There's never <laughs> been a time I've said that. They've, they've always been right. It's incredible. Dick Vitale called the Kentucky-Arkansas game, and Jay, he hadn't been to Fayetteville since the 90s, and, and there's a reason for that. Arkansas basketball hasn't been as good since the Nolan days, but I, I tried to go back and, and listen and, and watch a few old games. Have you ever called a game in Fayetteville, and if so, do you remember the last time when that was? I've never been to I've never been to a game uh, in Fayetteville, and there there are uh, a couple of places in college basketball I have not been yet. One of them is uh, is Arkansas. Um, uh, one is uh, I've never been. Although I've been to the University of Oregon, I've never done a game there. I've done Oregon games at other places, um, and uh, and I've never been to the Pit in New Mexico. Uh, but other than that, I've been just about everywhere. I think I've been everywhere in the SEC. Uh, with the, I've not been to Mississippi State, but I've been everybody everywhere else. I've not been, I've not been yet to, to Fayetteville, but I would love to go. I've seen so many good barbecue joints on <laughs> diners, drive-ins, and dives, and uh, I got, I got to get there because man, I got to, I got to eat at those places. Wait, you've been to Vanderbilt, or you've been to Oxford, you've been to Columbia, yeah. but you've not been to Fayetteville. That, there's something wrong about. I have that. not been to Fayetteville. Man, there is, about there that. is, there is something deeply wrong about it. I know you had a conversation with Herbie a little while back on a podcast. I find it interesting as you're kind of the face college basketball for ESPN, color analyst for college football is really Herbie. He's been that face for quite some time. You get plated with a lot of Duke games. He gets plated with a lot of Ohio State. 
just the dynamic of that. Have you guys had conversations about that? What it's like calling so many primetime games of your alma mater? We've not had a discussion about it. Um, uh, it we might have had a laugh about it, uh, it when we're together in different places. But I think uh, I think Herbie and I have the same sort of view of this. And, and look, people can believe this or not believe it, but uh, I don't care who wins. Every game I go to, I mean, it's been I can't I can't remember the last time I've watched a basketball game that that well I I take that back. When my son has been playing, I've cared who wins. But outside, my son went to Wake Forest um, and played basketball there. But outside of that, I don't care who wins. I see so many games every. I'm 56 years old. I've been in this business for 25 some years. I do games all the time. It's kind of like when, when people think that that uh, officials care, who like care. They don't care. Uh, I don't care. I, I'm, I go. I want to. Uh, all I really want when I go to a game is a close game, a close, compelling game that's going to be fun to watch and fun to broadcast. That's all I care about. Every game I do, somebody wins and somebody loses, and every game I do is an away game, and I do not care who wins. Um, and so it makes it easy. You just say what you see and you're prepared and all that stuff. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's always fun to go new places for me, but it's more because of the atmosphere rather than the game. Um, so like, like going to Fayetteville or all that stuff, that makes it it really fun for me. Um, and doing a Duke Carolina game is great, but I could, I could care less who wins. ESPN college basketball analyst Jay Billis, also former Duke Blue Devil. Jay, thanks for taking some time out of your morning to join the Morning Rush. Always great to be with you guys. Thank you.